Okay, let's dive back into it. So um, I hope I've given you uh, at least some feeling for a weak acid and the difference between a weak acid and a strong acid. Now, I haven't really told you yet why the weak acid is important, other than to say that the weak acid helps us to resist changes in pH. Now what I want to spend in uh, some time now is talking about the importance of that weak acid for resisting changes in pH. Whenever you hear change in pH, uh, you've got to be thinking changes in proton concentration. pH goes down, proton concentration goes up. Protons are little charged particles. They're charged particles. They can bind to amino acids in proteins. And when they bind to amino acids in proteins, they change the charge of the protein. And as we're going to see, in everything in biochemistry, structure and function are related. If I change the charge of a protein, I will change the structure of a protein. I will change its function. I may lose its function. And so it's important, if I want to maintain the structure of a protein, that I maintain a relatively constant amount of protons in that solution. If I don't, I've got problems. Okay? All right. Well, let's think about Let's go back to this equation right here. This equation right here with the HAC, H plus, and AC minus is one that I recommend students write down on the exam when you start working a problem because it will remind you about what's happening with that dissociation. This is a dissociation. Okay? Let's think about it. HAC goes to H plus and AC minus. And so far, the only thing that you've pulled out of your head is the fact that, well, it doesn't happen very often. It doesn't happen very frequently. So, well, maybe it's really insignificant because all I have to do then is think about, you know, one in a thousand. I mean, 999 of them are still HAC, so why do I care about it? I care about it because this is a flexible reaction. Flexible. Let's think about it. Let's say I've got this beaker that I've got some HAC that I've put into it. And I have in that beaker 999 molecules of HAC, and I have one of H plus and one of AC minus. That's what would happen, I said, if I put it in the solution, right? What if I add sodium hydroxide to that solution? What's sodium hydroxide going to do in that solution? Well, first of all, sodium hydroxide is a strong base. And strong bases will completely dissociate. So let's imagine I take and I put, I don't know, 499 molecules of sodium hydroxide in that solution. 490, I picked that number very much on purpose. You'll see why in a second. Okay. What's going to happen there? Well, the OH minus really, really, really would love to have a proton. Because when it combines with a proton, it makes water. It grabs that first proton that was sitting there and goes, yummy. Now, that HAC that was sitting there before says, whoops, what happened to my proton? Where's my proton? It's not there anymore. Oh, there's 999 of me. I'll give up another proton. OH minus gobbles it up. This process goes on for a while, and this happens instantaneously, until 499 more molecules of HAC gave up protons and got gobbled up by that OH minus. What did the HAC do? Well, that system resisted the change in pH. It resisted it. The OH, if it took away all the protons, there's no protons left. But HAC says, uh-uh, I'm going to replace them. I'm going to replace them. I'm going to replace them. And it does. At the end of this process, I have 500 molecules of HAC, and I have 500 molecules of AC minus. Everybody agree with me? 500 of this guy and 500 of this guy. Now, that pH didn't change very much. We haven't calculated the pH yet. And this is where the henderson hasselbalch equation becomes important. The way that you learned to calculate pH when you were in freshman chemistry was to use strong acids 
And if you had a 0.1 molar solution of HCl, you took the negative log of 0.1 and you got a pH of 1. That was because every HCl dissociated and gave up a proton. We don't know how many protons we've got at this point. You sort of think you know because I've been telling you about this one. But what I'm telling you is with a weak acid, to determine the proton concentration, we've got to use the henderson hasselbalch equation. Question? Oh, OK. We've got to use the henderson hasselbalch equation. I've just given you enough information to calculate the pH of this solution, and we're going to do it. Okay? The henderson hasselbalch equation told us that the pH of the solution was equal to the pKa of the acetic acid, which I told you was 4.76, plus the log of the concentration of AC minus and HAC. You will find that if you use quantities like molecules or moles, you don't even have to calculate concentration. I try to keep it simple for you. So if we plug in 500 and 500, we will get the same answer as if we calculated the concentration based on those, because they're both in the same volume. Well, what is 500 over 500? 1. And what is the log of 1? 0. We just calculated the pH of the solution. pH is equal to 4.76 plus 0, which is equal to 4.76. We just learned something very important. When the salt equals the acid, the pH equals the pKa. We could actually use that as a definition of the pKa if we wanted to. The pKa is the pH at which a, a, a buffer system has the salt and acid concentrations equal. OK. Now, that's all very cool. OK. This guy I said was resisting changes in pH. If I were to add back to this system, 100 protons, what do you suppose is going to happen? Go back to your equation. If I dump protons into this equation, what's going to happen to those protons? Are they just going to sit there? No? I see at least one hand head shaking no. What's going to happen to the protons? They will combine with the salt and make weak acid, HAC. Right? At the end of that process, if I add 100 protons, what's going to be the amount of HAC and AC minus? How many molecules of AC minus am I going to have? 400, because I lose 100, right? How many molecules of HAC am I going to have? 600, because I gain 100, right? I can calculate the pH of that solution by saying the pH is equal to 4.76 plus the log of 400 divided by 600. That's what you're going to do on your exam because you're not going to use a calculator. You can't use a calculator in my exam. How am I going to get the log of 0.4 or 400 over 600? You're not. You will get your answers to the point where you would punch it into a calculator and you're done. Now this means you don't have to worry that I punch it in the calculator right. All I have to do is the answer to that problem would be the pH is equal to 4.76 plus the log of 400 divided by 600. OK? My next question to you is, will that pH be below or above 4.76 in this solution I just gave you? It'll be below 4.76, says 1. Anybody say above? Nobody's going to be brave and take the opposing view. It's going to be below. Why is it going to be below? Mathematically, why is it going to be lower than the pKa? The log of a number less than 1, which is what 400 over 600 is, is always negative. A negative number from a positive number will create a smaller, a smaller positive number. You didn't need to have a calculator to do that. If I'd gone the other way and I had 600 over 400, you would say, oh, the pH of that solution, therefore, must be more than 4.76 because the log of a number greater than 1 
is a positive number. Okay, so we can learn practical aspects of these equations without having to crunch the numbers. That's useful and important for us to be able to do. Okay? Because I find that all too often students get mixed up into punching the numbers in and they get numbers that don't make any sense. Okay? Your aim in crunching numbers is to get answers. And so I'm trying to show you how you get answers without getting lost in the myriad of numbers. So no calculators on the exam. I will give you every equation that you need, and you need to know how to work through things like this. OK. Imagine I told you I had a solution that had twice as much or twice as many salt molecules as acid molecules, and the pH was 4. Would you know how to get the pKa? How would you do it? Choose the half spot equation. And what would you do? And you put it log over, you say half as many salt as acid? Twice as much salt as acid. Okay, so it's log of 2. Okay. I guess pH minus log of 2. PKA. pH minus the log of 2 would equal to pKa. And there's the answer to your problem. Make sense? So, any equation I give you will always have one unknown. The hardest thing students have is identifying the information that I have given them. It's important to go through and spend some time thinking about these, which is why I want you writing down this equation. HAC goes to H plus and AC minus, because it tells us what happens in solution. It tells us if I add NaOH, what happens to protons? They go away. And HAC makes up the difference. It tells me that if I add protons to the solution, that AC minus gobbles them up and makes HAC. That's a very, very fundamental thing for us to understand as it relates to um, uh, pH. OK. Now, I'm going to give you a rule that if there's something you want to memorize, you can memorize this rule that I think you will find helpful. Okay? You can actually get it from the henderson hasselbach equation. But the rule is as follows. Okay? This is an assumption. It's only good as an assumption. It's not good for accuracy. But for an assumption, it's pretty good. The rule is this. If the pH of a solution is more than one unit below the pKa, we can assume that essentially everything is in the weak acid form. If the pH is more than one unit below the pKa, we can essentially assume that everything is in the weak acid form, meaning there's very, very little salt there. On the other hand, if the pH is more than one unit above the pKa, we can assume that essentially everything that's there is in the salt form and very little in the acid, weak acid form. Now, that may not seem at the moment to be very important to you, but when we start looking at amino acids, which we will look at in just a little bit, we'll see it's a very, very useful thing for us to understand. Make sure you understand those considerations. I will not give you those considerations on an exam. You need to know those. Okay? Now, someone asked me at the very, uh, I meant to answer the question. Someone asked me at the, at the beginning of the break, well, there's all kinds of information in this class. There's your videos, there's your lectures, there's your notes, there's your highlights. At the end of the day, I will write highlights and summarizing what I saw uh, as important in the lecture. There's the book. Do I have to know everything there is to know there? Well, of course, all of these things are aimed at getting you to understand the information. I have in this class a, a hierarchy of information that I give to you. Everything I say in class is fair game. I am not going to go to the book and find obscure things that I haven't talked about and test you on them. The book is there to help you better understand the things that I'm talking about. So the hierarchy of information is what I say is the most important. The highlights are pretty good summaries of what I talk about. Okay? So they're probably the second level of importance. <coughs> the book is there as a supplement to help you better understand what I talk about. So seeing it in a different way explained in a different way may be helpful to you. Does that make sense? 
If I say it in class, it's fair game, okay? But I'm not going to pick things out of the book that I haven't talked about. If I haven't talked about it, I'm not going to hold you responsible for it, okay? That's my deal with you. Okay. All right. Well, we've made some pretty good progress. One thing I haven't talked about with you um, is what a buffer is. Or I haven't shown you at least graphically what a buffer is. So we need to think about this. A buffer is a system that has a weak acid and a salt. It's specifically an aqueous system because it's always dissolved in water. And a buffer resists change in pH. When you hear the term buffer, you should think resists change in pH. You should also think buffer equals salt plus weak acid. Now, frequently people abbreviate a, a general term for a weak acid. You saw the term, the, the thing I gave you up here that said that the buffer, where am I at? Ah, come on. Okay, this was an acetic acid buffer. HAC goes to H plus plus AC minus. If we wrote this in general terms for any acid, we would just simply say HA goes to H plus plus A minus. Okay? You wonder how you get an A minus in this class? You just basically lose a proton and you've got an A minus. Pretty good, huh? Okay, bad joke. Okay. Now, so a buffer has, oh, what did I do? Come on. Oh, come on. There we go. Come on, you. There we go. All right. Now, let's think about what buffers do with respect to pH. I've told you the buffers help resist the change of pH. Graphically, we can now understand that, I think, a little bit better. So let's take a look at a titration plot. You probably did titrations when you were in freshman chemistry. Let's look at what a titration plot looks like. This high-quality graphic was produced by yours truly. Because amazingly enough, your book didn't have a good one. Okay? Your book had a pretty stupid one. Here is a, uh, a uh, weak acid buffer, weak acid salt system. It's a buffer that has a pKa of about 2.5. Okay? And if we look at this system, we can see what happens to the pH as we get near that buffer. When I do a titration, in this class, I will start with a molecule at a very, very low pH, just to be consistent with you, so you understand this overall process. All the molecules I give you when we do a, when we do a titration will start at a very low pH. pH on the y-axis, amount of OH added on the x-axis. If I ask you to draw a graph in this class and you don't put axes on it, it's wrong, no matter how beautiful the graph looks. You must, must, must label your axes, all right? Without the axes, the shape of a graph has no meaning. The shape of the graph derives its shape from the numbers being plotted. So in this case, I'm plotting pH versus amount of OH added. I start the solution at a very low pH. In this case, the pH I have is about zero. Let's think about that rule that I gave you about protons being on and protons being off. All right? The rule I said was that the pH was more than one unit below the pKa. What, happened to the, what, hap what do we have mostly present? The weak acid. Okay? We have the weak acid mostly present. Down here, if I were to say what is mostly present at pH zero, I would hope that you would tell me HA. Be, HA being the weak acid. As I start adding OH, look what happens to the pH. It starts rising, and it starts rising relatively rapidly. But Kevin, you said a buffer resists change in pH. Yep, within a limited range. The limited range in which a buffer works is about one pH unit below the pKa to one pH unit above the pKa. And that, not coincidentally, was the rule that I gave you. If the pH was more than one unit below, you essentially had the proton on. If the pH was more than one unit above, the proton was essentially off. 
This guy has an effective buffering range from about 1.5 up to about 3.5. What does a buffering range mean? You can actually see it on the graph. Look at this. I added this much OH, and I went up more than a pH unit. If I add that same amount over here, how much do I go up? Less than a pH unit. The closer I'm getting to here, the more this curve flattens, meaning that the pH is not going up as rapidly in this region as it was in this region. The buffer is resisting the pH change within a pH unit of the pKa. Now, you'll notice that this graph is flattest at the pKa. And by the way, pKa is nothing magical. The, pH, the pKa is a pH. Remember, it's the pH at which salt equals acid. So it is a pH. We call it pKa, but it's just a special pH salt it is. Okay? This guy is the flattest at the pKa. What that means is this buffer's ability to resist change in pH is greatest when the pH equals the pKa. If I add protons here, if I add this amount of protons here, the pH goes up a little tiny bit. If I take proton, I mean, if I add protons here, it goes, it goes down just a little tiny bit. If I take protons away, it goes up just a little tiny bit. Whereas out here, I take the same amount of protons and add the same amount of protons, and it goes up much more. Okay? So that's important to understand. It's very important to understand that the maximum buffering capacity is when the pH equals the pKa, which is when salt equals acid. Now, intuitively, this sort of makes sense. It makes very good sense. Let's imagine I'm back in that solution of acetic acid and, and um, an AC minus, HAC and AC minus. Okay? I had 500 of each. Wouldn't this be a balance that would be the the most difficult place to change those proton concentrations? If I add protons, I tip it this way. If I take away protons, I tip it this way. The maximum ability to balance this is when the two are equal. That's why we're at maximum buffering capacity when pH equals pKa. Okay, I'm doing a lot of talking. Let me stop and ask if there's any questions. You guys are the quietest class I've ever had. Does that mean I'm being incredibly clear? No, I know I know better than that. I'm not stupid. You guys ready for a pop quiz? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, I'll give you a pop quiz. You want a pop quiz? Yeah. What's that? Some of the stuff we already talked about, yeah. Okay, take out a piece of paper. <laughs> this way I know if you if you learned material or not. Okay? Um let's see. I've got a solution that's at maximum buffering capacity. It's a buffer that has a total of 0.6 moles in it. If I want to have twice as much salt as acid, what do I have to do to it? I've got a buffer. I've got points. I've got 0.6 moles of a buffer, and um, it's at maximum buffering capacity. If I want to have twice as much salt as acid, what do I have to do to it? And then I want you to take that information and put all that you know about that into the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation.
Okay, everybody got that? Okay, everybody got it? Put your name on it and turn it in. Got it? Just pass them forward, I guess. Yeah. Salt is acid, yep. Yep. Okay, pass and forward, folks. Got it? Okay, now, my reason for doing this isn't to be mean, but um, rather to point out that when you, if you don't know something, then it's important to ask, okay? Because part of my job is to help you. And how many people felt confident in their answer? How many people didn't feel very confident at all? Where were your questions? <laughs> How can I help you if you don't ask me questions? Okay? Important for me to be able to help you. Now, you might say, well, I don't know enough to ask a question. Okay? That's fine. That's fine. I understand that. It might, as I say, I'm not doing this to be mean. These guys aren't going to count for anything. So don't sweat it. Okay? But it's a lesson in using okay, me to help you. Right. I want to help you. Now, I realize that maybe, well, I don't know what question to ask, et cetera, et cetera, is a factor. But if there are questions, and I know there are questions out here, and you don't ask them, then there's no way that I can help you if you, if you don't do that. Okay? So please take advantage of that as much as you can. All right? The answer to the problem is very simple. Okay? Remember, you had 0.6 moles of buffer. I said buffer is equal to salt plus weak acid, right? I said it was at maximum buffering capacity, so that should tell you that each one is present in equal amounts. So to start with, I had weak acid 0.3 moles. I had salt at 0.3 moles. If I want to have twice as much salt as acid, they still got to add up to 0.6, so I've got to have 0.4 moles of salt, 0.2 moles of acid. How do I get 0.4 moles of salt from starting with 0.3? Well, I have to add 0.1 moles of NaOH. Make sense? OK. So if you don't understand that, that's fine. Come see me. I'll be happy to explain it to you uh, in other, other terms. OK? Maybe if you could just like, run through that whole thing just one more time. Sure. I think I've understood it. I OK, it. sure. All right. So the problem was that I have a buffer. So when you hear buffer, like I said, the first thing I want you to think of is buffer equals salt plus acid. So the key was I had 0.6 moles of buffer. Well, if buffer equals salt plus acid, and salt plus acid equals 0.6, and salt equals acid, then I must start with 0.3 moles of each. Right? That's my starting material. In the end, I want to have twice as much salt as acid. So I could say 2s plus s equals 0.6. I'm sorry, 2a plus a equals 0.6, right? So A must equal 0.2. Therefore, salt must equal twice that, which would be equal to 0.4, right? 
So now my final has got to have 0.4 moles of salt, 0.2 moles of acid. So I have to go from 0.3 and 0.3 to 0.4 and 0.2. That's a difference of 0.1. And since I'm making salt, I have to be adding sodium hydroxide. Does that make sense? And if not, that's fine too. Come see me. I'll be happy to, to step you through it. I don't want to have this be a limitation because I think it's, these are understandable concepts. And if you haven't thought about them before, you may not be thinking about them right now, but you will. You can do this. Okay. I can guarantee you. And I don't want that to be an impediment to you. Okay. Well, what I want to do is get a little bit further ahead because we have a 4th of July that actually interrupts this term. And so that takes one day away from us, which is two hours. So I'd like to get a little bit ahead whenever I have the opportunity to do it. We've got an opportunity to do that right now. And it's a good time for us to get uh, a little bit further ahead. So I want to talk about proteins, and I want to talk about amino acids. So I'm going to start talking about amino acids. And we're going to see how the henderson hasselbalch equation is very, very <coughs> excuse me, useful and important for us to understand amino acids, their charges, and the charges that they give to proteins. These are very, very important things for us to begin to understand. Okay? So let's talk about protein structure. Protein structure um, is absolutely essential to understanding protein function. As I said earlier in class, protein structure is essential for protein function. If I destroy structure, I destroy function. And we're going to see that proteins are exquisitely sensitive to changes in pH. The reason that they're exquisitely sensitive to changes in pH is they can gain, they can lose protons. And since protons are charged particles, the charge of the protein is changing. So proteins are exquisitely sensitive to changes in charge. Very, very important point. We have to be able to predict charges of proteins because we need to know, is this protein going to function or is this protein not going to function? That's a very, very important concept for us. Okay? Well, structure function is, important, is an important consideration. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Okay? A couple of examples. Number one example right here. This is a beautiful example. Okay? That looks like, well, somebody just drew a nice ring around DNA. It turns out to be a really important protein. This protein that you see on the screen is shown as a dimer, meaning two pieces. They're two identical pieces. The two identical pieces form this ring around DNA, like a little engagement ring for DNA. Okay? This ring is called a beta clamp. Anybody ever heard of a beta clamp before? Probably not. Okay. Beta clamp is a very important protein. When replication of DNA occurs, the DNA polymerase that does the replication has to grab hold of the DNA and not let go. Well, the DNA polymerase has a lot of things that it's doing. It's polymerizing, it's putting in bases, it's doing all this sort of stuff. So it doesn't directly grab a hold of the DNA. It grabs a hold of this protein. This protein actually holds the DNA polymerase on the DNA so it doesn't fall off. Now, the structure is essential for the function because, as you can see, it's made a ring around there. The DNA can't get away. This ring can slide up and down the DNA. But if I destroy the ring structure by, for example, opening it up, it will fall off of the DNA. The structure is essential for its function. If I disturb the structure of this thing, I'm going to disturb the ability of the cell to replicate its DNA. I have to be able to maintain the integrity of this structure. Okay. Here's a very cool set of proteins. Okay? These guys are basically self-assembling proteins. Some of you are engineers. Some of you are very interested in nanotechnology. Because with nanotechnology, we're interested in making nanoscopic things do stuff for us. Okay? There's some really cool stuff. People have made little nanoscopic motors or little nanoscopic walking molecules. Literally walking molecules. They're kind of cool. Okay? Biology figured out nanotechnology long before humankind ever invented, th thought they, quote, invented the technology. 
we didn't invent nanotechnology, biology invented it. Because these guys are proteins that can put themselves together. Okay? Imagine having a jigsaw puzzle, throwing it out on the table, and the puzzle assembles itself. That's what these proteins do. Okay? When we look at a virus, a virus we are taught has a protein coat. It has a protein coat, and inside that protein coat is where it keeps its nucleic acid that the virus needs to reproduce. Okay? The protein coat that a virus makes assembles itself. It comes together. It literally puts the pieces together itself. Okay? Proteins are pretty amazing things. Okay? This is one of many examples that we will see. Okay. Another th a very important fe feature to understand about proteins is that proteins are not rigid structures. Whoa, but you said structure means function. Now you're saying they're flexible. Yes, there are. there's a range of flexibility within, within which a protein will function properly. And it turns out that that flexibility is absolutely essential for enzymatic action. Enzymes we are going to see are trillions of times faster than chemical catalysts. Trillions of times faster than chemical catalysts because they're flexible. Chemical catalysts are not flexible. Platinum is not a flexible atom. But proteins are flexible molecules, and we'll see how that flexibility gives proteins to do some absolutely amazing things. Okay, well, proteins, of course, are comprised of amino acids. And so I'm going to start with the very first, what we describe as level of protein structure. The first level of protein structure includes the sequence of amino acids comprising it. The sequence. There are 20 amino acids that we find in proteins. Okay? Amino acids derive their name from the fact that they all have a general structure that looks like what you see on the screen. Okay? They have L isomers and they have D isomers. And no, I'm not going to ask you on an exam to identify which one is which. But it's important for you to know that virtually all amino acids found in all proteins on the face of the Earth are in the L configuration. Virtually every one is. We all use the same <coughs> amino acids, and we use the same biased amino acids to make our proteins. That makes sense, because where do we get our amino acids from? Things that we eat. If we can't use the amino acids in the things that we eat because they've got a different configuration, then it wouldn't, eating wouldn't serve any purpose, would it? Biology has evolved to all use the same set of tools. Biologically made amino acids have that structural bias. Chemically made amino acids do not. The chemists in here know that when you chemically make something, you make a random mixture of the two. If I chemically synthesize this amino acid, I will get half of the molecules present in the D form and half of the molecules present in the L form. Chemistry does not give me specificity. Biology gives me specificity. And that's not because of any magic in biology. It has to do with the fact that the enzymes that make these have specific 3D structures. They can only make one. They can't make the other form. Okay. Now, this is important. If we think about one of the reasons, one of the things people are interested in is, well, is there life elsewhere in the universe? One of the things that people like to do when they get a meteorite that falls from space. One of the first things they do is they crack it open and they analyze the amino acids in it, looking for, is there a bias? Because if there's a bias, it says that the amino acids that are in there were not made by random chemistry. They had to be made by some selective process, the most logical one being a living organism. Okay? It's a very cool way of seeing is life out there. There's not any examples I know of, but people still look. Okay. 
Now, so the L isomer is very important. We do see the D isomer in rare occasions, and I'll, I may say something later in the term about places where we occasionally see the D isomer. But for the most part, 99.99% .99 of all the amino acids on Earth produced biologically are produced in the L configuration. Okay. Now, this schematic view, and again, I'm not going to ask you to draw this, but you should know that every amino acid has these important constituents. It has a central carbon, you see here, known as, labeled as the alpha carbon. Every amino acid has an amine group, known as the alpha amine. Every amino acid has a carboxyl group, known as the alpha carboxyl. There's three different alphas for you. The alpha carbon, the alpha amine, and the alpha carboxyl. Every amino acid has an R group, and it's in the R group that all amino acids differ from each other. The only place where amino acids differ from each other is in the, in the content of the R group. All amino acids have a hydrogen. Now, what that tells us is this is the reason we have DNL. We know from organic chemistry that wherever we have a we have a carbon that has four different things attached to it. There's two different ways of arranging those four different things in three-dimensional space, giving rise to the D and the L isomers that we see. Okay. All right. Now, we've been talking about pH. Let's think about pH relative to amino acids. And oh, by the way, let's go back here and look at this one more time. You'll notice... This guy has a charge, and you'll notice this guy has a charge. It turns out these guys are both weak acids. Amino acids have two weak acids in them, a carboxyl group and an amine group. Okay. Now we've got a, a more complicated picture than we had when we had the acetic acid, which only had one proton excuse me, that could come off. This guy has got two places it can gain or lose protons. We'll see how that comes into play in the next figure. Okay, so when we look at amino acid ionization, come on, there we go. Okay, here's that same amino acid, okay? We see that it exists in three different forms. The first form that we see up here in pink, okay, has all of the protons on. Notice that when a carboxyl group has a proton on, and yes, you should make note of this, it has a charge of zero. When an amine group has a proton on, it has a charge of plus one. Both the carboxyl group and the amine group have their own pKa's. The carboxyl group an alpha carboxyl group generally has a pKa around 2.2. Again, you don't need to know that. I'll give you that on an exam. The alpha amine group generally has a pKa around 9.5. There's some slight variations, but for, our, for all practical purposes, they're about 9.5. Now, which one of those is the stronger acid? Which group? Carboxyl, right? The one that has the lowest pKa is the strongest acid. That was the first thing we talked about, right? So the carboxyl had a 2.2. The amine had a 9.5. Therefore, this guy, the carboxyl, is the strongest acid. And we can see this because look at this pH plot down here. We're looking, plotting concentration as a function of pH. We're plotting concentration of the pink guy by this red line. We see what's happening to the pink guy. It's just dropping in concentration as we keep taking protons away. Okay, we're raising the pH here. Notice it means we're taking protons away. We take protons away, the first proton that's going to be lost is this guy right here on the, on the carboxyl group. We see that happened right here in the blue guy. This guy has, is, has lost or is losing its proton, whereas the amine group still has it. That sort of makes sense, right? 
they each have their own pKa values. What did I say the pKa was for the carboxyl? I said it was about 2.2. If I have more than one pH unit above that pKa, what's going to happen to the salt acid for the carboxyl? I'll have more salt. The salt is the COO minus. When I get out here to pH 4, I essentially have nothing left in the pink form, and I have everything left in the blue form. I've lost that proton. I haven't touched this proton. Why? Well, because, uh, because at this pH, pH 6, I'm more than one pH unit below the pKa of the amine group. What's going to happen to the amine proton? It's going to be on. And that's what I see in the blue molecule here. Okay? Now, as I keep raising the pH, I see that the, the blue molecule concentration starts going down, and I start seeing the other guy appearing where the amine has lost the proton. Now both molecules have lost their proton, and as I get out here to pH, let's say, 11.5, I'm more than one pH unit above the pKa, essentially all that proton is gone. Now people say, well, how can you have two pKa's but three molecules? PKAs don't relate to molecules. They relate to ionizations. And ionizations always involve two molecules. Here's a PKA between these two molecules. Here's a PKA between these two molecules. If you try to link PKAs to individual molecules, you will always be wrong. PKAs describe dissociation between two different molecules. Okay. So, we see, look at what's happened to this molecule. It started on the left in the pink. It started with a charge of overall charge of plus one. That is a charge of plus one here and a charge of zero here. It went from a charge of plus one to a charge of zero because it lost a proton. Well, that makes sense. I take one and I take one away from it. I'm going to get zero. And I take one more proton away and I get an overall charge of minus one. I've changed the charge of this guy twice. Changing pH is going to change the charge of these molecules. And as I said, changing charge is something important for us to keep in mind. Make sense? OK. All right. Now, um, let's talk about the individual uh, amino acids. I'm not going to make you memorize the structure of the amino acids. But there are some things about the amino acids that you need to know. You need to know the names of all 20 of them. Okay. You need to know which of the groups they fit into up here. Okay. Now, different books group them slightly differently. What I have on the screen is the way that your, your book groups them, and I'm grouping them that way. You'll notice, I believe that your book calls these guys down here basic amino acids, and I told you I'm not using that term unless we're talking about a strong base, and these guys are not strong bases. So I call them amino and you'll see why in a minute. Okay. All right, so let's look at uh, some of the amino acids. I'll tell you a little bit about each one and some of the things, some of their general chemistry you should know. You don't need to know glycine is GLY. You don't need to know we call it G. If you want to learn those, you can, but I'm not going to require it. And I will give you any relevant names on the exam. I'll call it glycine, so there's no question about which one I'm talking about. Okay. Glycine is the simplest amino acid. Glycine has, is the only amino acid that doesn't have DNL isomers. Why? Well, glycine's R group is an H. Glycine, therefore, only has three different things attached to it, not four. It takes four different things for it to have stereoisomers. Therefore, glycine is the only one that doesn't have stereoisomers. It only has one form. Alanine is a simple amino acid. And with alanine, we can see that the R group consists of a methyl group. No, you don't need to memorize. It's a methyl group. That would be, that'd be kind of like cheating, saying you're not going to memorize the structures, but then I say you have to memorize that it's a methyl group. That's not appropriate. But these guys are what we describe as simple amino acids. Okay? They're simple because we see, for example, that in both cases, the R groups are not very large. If we go to the aliphatic amino acids, these guys, Question? Oh, okay. 
These guys are what we describe as relatively hydrophobic, meaning that they have R groups that don't like to associate with water. Examples include valine, and there's the structure down here, which may be easier for you to see. Leucine, whose structure you can see here. And isoleucine, whose structure is over here. Last, it includes methionine. And methionine is notable because it's one of two amino acids that contains a sulfur atom. None of these R groups are very polar. They don't like to associate with water. And what we will see as a consequence is that we don't see these guys very often on the surface of proteins. We see them on the internal portions of proteins. OK. All right. Now, um, the next group. The next group is a single uh, amino acid. Come on. All right. It's the only one in its class. It's called proline. And proline is the only R group that comes around and reacts with the amine group. There's the alpha amine, and notice that the R group of proline has made a cyclic, come on, quit that, made a cyclic compound to come around and link with the alpha amine. The alpha amine can still ionize just like before. It now ionizes as NH2 instead of as NH3, but it's the same uh, issue. Because proline has this ring structure, it has some unusual properties in a protein. Proline is the least flexible amino acid. I said flexibility was important for a protein, and the flexibility arises from the flexibility of individual amino acids. The inflexibility of proline gives rise to inflexible portions of a protein structure. This affects shape of a protein strongly. Okay. Now, um, the next group, the aromatics. Not surprisingly, they have a benzene ring in them. Okay? We have phenylalanine, we have tyrosine, and we have tryptophan. Tryptophan is notable because it has a great, big, bulky ring. It has two rings, in fact. But even phenylalanine has, fairly, has a fairly large R group. Tyro, uh, uh, and tyrosine has a fairly large R, R group. When we start putting amino acids together to make proteins, we're going to see that the size of the R group really does affect the shape of the protein. Because there's certain ways that a protein cannot fold because these big, heavy R groups get in the way. That's an important consideration in protein shape. OK? How am I doing on time? Almost getting there. OK. The next group um, are the aliphatic hydroxyls. These guys really like water. They don't ionize. That is, that their, their R groups don't ionize. Every amino acid ionizes. But none of the amino acids I've shown you so far have an R group that will ionize. These guys are included. Their R groups don't ionize either. It's simply a hydroxyl. And hydroxyl can make hydrogen bonds with water. And so these guys have R groups that like water considerably. Serine and threonine. Okay are two of three amino acids that have hydroxyls. The other one was tyrosine. You should know that. Serine, threonine, tyrosine. That's the only three that have hydroxyl groups. Now, that will turn out to be very important later because hydroxyl groups are places of attachment of phosphates. These are the three amino acids where phosphates get attached. And they get attached on the R groups of these molecules. OK. Next group, carboxamides. Okay. These guys don't ionize either. It looks like they might, but they don't. Okay. So when, oh, come on here. when we look at asparagine, we say, well, how come that thing there doesn't gain a proton or lose a proton? The reason is because there's all these electrons over here. Okay? So this guy doesn't ionize. Asparagine has a structure that's like that. It's called a carboxamide because it would be a carboxyl group, except for the amide has, a pla has replaced, uh, the amine group has replaced the um, hydroxyl of the carboxyl group, so we call it a carboxamide. Glutamine is another one. So in essence, these guys each have an extra amine group. 
We won't talk about it here, but if you ever take amino acid metabolism, you'll discover that these two are very important because they allow movement of nitrogen in the nitrogen cycle. Very, very important consideration, but we won't talk about that here. Okay, next group. Here's the first of the ones we'll talk about that ionize. Cysteine is a really interesting amino acid. It is the only amino acid that has a sulfhydryl group. It's the second amino acid that has a sulfur, but the sulfur is in a different configuration here. It's in the form of a sulfhydryl. Sulfhydryl, you recall from your organic chemistry, is an SH. There is the SH right there. And that H can come off. It can ionize. The SH group has a pKa of about 8. When it comes off, it makes an S minus. Now, that's not the main reason that cysteine is interesting. Cysteine is interesting because that sulfur is fairly reactive. It really likes to bond with another sulfur. If I take two SHs and I put them together, the H's will disappear and I'll make a covalent bond between the two S's called a disulfide bond. I put two SHs together, I make a disulfide bond that's a covalent bond that didn't exist before and we'll see in protein structure that's very important. So cysteines play very, very important roles in protein structure. All right, we're getting near the end. Amino. I call these amino instead of calling them basic. Your book calls them basic because they can have a proton, but since we're not calling weak bases bases, we're calling them, we're calling them other things. I call these amino containing because if we look at their R groups, they all have amine groups out there. There's lysine's amine group. Notice it's charged. There's arginine's R group. Notice it's charged. We will treat this as if it's an NH3, as if it's a single NH3. But as you can see, it's a resonant structure. The charge is shared. Histidine, the third one. It can gain an extra proton. It gains a proton right there, where I have that plus sign. And when it does that, it becomes positively charged. Each of these guys can gain or lose a proton in their R group. Now, the pKa's for these are interesting. If we look at the pKa's, oh, I do that all the time. If I look at the pKa for lysine and arginine, it's fairly high. It's on the order of 10 to 12. Okay, the pKa for histidine is about six. Now that turns out to be important because histidine can gain and lose a proton relatively easily near physiological pH. It's like cysteine in that respect. Cysteine had a pKa of about 8. This guy has a pKa of about 6. And yes, I will give you these on an exam. You're not going to memorize these pKa's. All right? Gesundheit. OK? The ability to gain and lose a proton near physiological pH turns out to have really important implications in catalyzing reactions. Charges not only affect the ability of a proton to have a certain structure, they also affect the ability of a protein to catalyze a reaction. If a histidine can gain a charge at a physiological pH and become a more active enzyme, that's really good. That's really important. And so we frequently see histidines near the places in enzymes where reactions are catalyzed very frequently. We'll see some examples later in the term. Okay. Now, the last group of uh, proteins, uh, or the last group of, of amino acids that we'll talk about are the carboxyl containing amino acids. Okay? Aspartic acid and glutamic acid, or aspartate and glutamate, I use the terms interchangeably, they're the same thing. Okay? Technically, they're not, but I use the terms interchangeably. They have R groups that, in this case, have been drawn with the protons off. You see it's a carboxyl with a negative charge. Here's glutamic acid with a negative charge. Now, if you're thinking about this, you're thinking, oh, wow, so some amino acids have three pKa's. Yes, they do. You need to be able to know from the amino acids which ones ionize and what their charges are when they ionize, when they gain or lose a proton. 
the amino-containing ones, when they have the proton on, will all have a, an R group with a plus charge. The, car the carboxyl ones, when they gain or lose a proton, when they lose a proton, they've got a negative. When they gain a proton, they've got a zero charge. You will need to know that on the exam. Okay? So you don't have to know the structures, but you need to know, for example, the carboxyls will duh -uh, have carboxyl groups. The amines have duh -uh, amino groups. And from that, you, know, you need to know the charge, what happens when you put a proton onto a carboxyl group, or you take a proton off a carboxyl group, or you put a proton onto an amine group, or you take a proton off of an amine group. Now, I will talk more about that next time. But before we leave, I thought we would do something fun. And um, yay. We're going to sing. Yeah, you know about singing? OK. So uh, I like to write songs called the Metabolic Melodies. And I thought we would start the term off by singing a song I have never sung to a class. I've just written it very recently. And it's called Henderson Hasselbach. Anybody know the song, My Country Tis of Thee? OK, here we go. Henderson Hasselbach, you put my brain in shock. Oh, woe is me. The PKAs can make me lie in bed awake. They really give me bad headaches. Oh, hear my plea. Salt, acid, ray. I can't hear you. She owes. Help keep the pH froze by buffering. They show tenacity, complete audacity, if used with incapacity to maintain things. I know when H's fly, a buffer will defy them actively. Those protons cannot waltz when they get bound to salts. With this, the change in pH halts all praise to thee. Thus, now that I've addressed this topic for the test, I've got know-how. The pH, I can say, equals the pKa in sum with log of S or A. I know it now. All right. <laughs> now you can't say you don't know Henderson Hasselbach. <laughs> all right, folks, that's all for today, and I will see you tomorrow.